are grateful that you're here and certainly want to make mention of our lectureship and the excellent lessons that we had during that time. Uh, the speakers all did an excellent job, even Tim. Uh, and it was a good time that we had. Uh, this congregation is to be, uh, this is the 39th le lectureship that we've conducted. And certainly, congregation is to be congratulated on that and the good work that uh, all of you did. Uh, many times don't get the credit that those who are speakers get, but without the work behind the scenes, then it wouldn't be put on. So we appreciate all the hard work that you've done throughout the years in relationship to the lectureship. Uh, the lessons are already on our website. Uh, and so you can always direct people to that. Of course, the, there are a host of sermons. Uh, there's the Bible Correspondence Course, uh, several different lectureships through the years that are on our website. Uh, use that to and, you know, tell people, go to this website and you know, view this lesson or view that lesson. Um, also, I re-encoded the files and uploaded them to my YouTube page. And so all of the this year's minus two lessons right now. Uh, and all of last year's lessons are on my YouTube page and along with a lot of other classes and sermons. So um, now on my YouTube page, it's high definition. On our web page, it's not. Um, we have to worry about bandwidth and space and things like that, those type of considerations. When we're using, when I'm using YouTube, don't have to worry about any of that. Uh, so that's why I can put those on high definition and we don't on the website. Uh, but there's over 200 videos on my YouTube account. In fact, I think I looked this morning and I think it's over 270 uh, videos. So there's a host of material on that as well. Just some things that we can use, especially in our society as technology is advancing. Uh, a lot of people will go to things like YouTube or view something online that they might not come physically to a building like unto this and uh, we have the opportunity then of teaching them the truth that way. So take advantage of those opportunities. We have been in the previous lessons uh, considering the Christian's look. And while I realize each one of these lessons could be an individual lesson all by itself, I'm putting them together for sake of uh, continuity. Now, we looked at the aspect uh, that the Christian looks into salvation. The prophet Anna, Annas, or Anna, uh, when she came into the temple where Jesus was, spake concerning uh, him to all of them, it says, that looked for redemption in Jerusalem, Luke 2 and verse 38. And so we look into salvation. Also, we would see that in 1 Peter 1 and verse 12, uh, that here's the angels had a desire to look into the salvation that is going to be revealed in Jesus. Well, we looked at that salvation, both God's part and the grace that he demonstrated in the giving of his son, the grace that he demonstrated in giving us the word of God. 
his word so that we would know what we must do. And we find out then what we must do, that upon our faith we must repent. We make a confession of our faith in Jesus Christ as God's Son. We are baptized for the remission of our sins, and then we must live continually in faithfulness to Him. But then also, then we looked at, or we considered looking unto Jesus as found in Hebrews 12 and verse 2. Looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of, and while the King James says, our faith, it is literally the faith. He's talking about the Word of God, that Jesus is the author, the bringer forth, the finisher, the one who completes the faith, the Word of God. And in connection with that, we look into the law. James 1 and verse 25, that we look into the perfect law of liberty and thus our need to study the scriptures to see what they have to say to us. But this morning I want us to consider looking one on another. And I'm going to take this from John 4 and verse 35. And the apostles are returning from Samaria, and Jesus has been speaking with this woman of Samaria, and they have gone to get food, and they are now returning, and Jesus is teaching them a spiritual lesson, that, and the fact that the spiritual takes precedence over the physical. And he tells his apostles, Say not ye, there are yet four months, and then cometh the harvest. Behold, I say unto you, lift up your eyes and look on the fields, for they are white already to harvest. This, of course, is said in relationship to preaching the gospel to the lost. And certainly we as Christians have that obligation. We have the responsibility to take the gospel to the world. In the Great Commission, Matthew's account, Matthew 28, verse 19 and verse 20, Jesus says, To go ye therefore, and King James has teach all nations, it is literally make disciples of all nations, baptizing them into the name of the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you, and lo, I am with you always, even unto the end of the world. The imperative, and the phrase, or the word imperative, it, that's a Greek tense. The imperative tense is a command. It's an order. The order that Jesus sets forth here is to go make disciples, or actually make disciples, and it is as you're going. Going, make disciples. So as you're going, this is what you're to do. This is the command, make disciples. He then tells us how those disciples are going to be made in the remaining part of verse 19 and verse 20. He says, using two modal participles, baptizing and teaching. The baptizing is baptizing them, and King James again uses the word in. It is literally in two. It is looking into something. It is looking forward to this. It is, as Arnton Gingrich puts it, being baptized into a relationship with, and in this case, a relationship with deity. One of, I believe, the strongest arguments for baptism being necessary for salvation is right here. A lot of times we miss it because we have ingrained in our minds being baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and we immediately state after that, in the name of means by the authority of. That's not what it means here. Now, don't get me wrong. We are baptizing by the authority of God, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. But that's not what this verse is teaching. This verse is teaching you're being baptized into a relationship with them. In other words, 
prior to baptism, there is no relationship. The only way you can have that relationship with deity is through the act of baptism. That's what this is saying when it says being baptized literally into, and the American standard uses the word into instead of in, into the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, or the Holy Ghost. And the other aspect is teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I commanded you. We see in that the necessity of teaching. Baptism cannot take place, not scriptural baptism or Bible baptism, without teaching. And so in making a disciple, teaching must be done. And we might add the disciples were called Christians first in Antioch, Acts 11, chapter and verse 26. So when he, Jesus gives that command, go make disciples, or to make disciples, he's saying, go make Christians. The way in which a Christian is made is by baptizing and by teaching. Teaching is necessary step in becoming a Christian, in becoming a disciple. That teaching has to continue. It's not just an initial teaching and then forget everything. But it is continual teaching. Baptism, on the, hand, on the other hand, is a one-time act. You're baptized into that relationship. But the teaching goes on and on. And so teaching them all that Jesus has commanded you. Well, what did Jesus just commanded? He had just stated a command, make disciples. And thus, if they were to teach them, those that they were making disciples, all that Jesus had commanded, and he just commanded to go make disciples, then we have that obligation as well. We are to go and, go and make disciples among all nations. And it's done in exactly the same way that Jesus set forth by baptizing them into that relationship with deity and by teaching them to observe all things that Jesus commanded. But that's our responsibility as Christians, as disciples of Christ, to make disciples, to make Christians by teaching them and by baptizing them. Thus, we need to get out and go teach the gospel. Mark's account of this same uh, commission, Mark 16, 15 and 16, is to go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. He that believeth not shall be damned. And notice the parallel in this. When we add in with this what Paul would write in Romans 10 and verse 17 that faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. What is it? Teaching them all that Jesus has commanded. There's the word of God being taught to them that produces faith. And thus, he that believeth, there's faith, and is baptized, is what? being baptized in that relationship with deity. They are having their sins taken away. They are being saved. And thus, the two passages are parallel. But go preach the gospel. That's our duty. That's our responsibility. We many times think we can build this building or a building likened to this, open the doors, put a sign out there on the front, and basically say, come and get it. But that's not what Jesus tells us to do. As you're going. Now, as you leave this building, you go make disciples. As you leave this building, you go preaching the gospel to every creature, to those people you come in contact with on a daily basis or maybe not even a daily basis, when you come in contact with someone, teach them the gospel. Make a disciple out of them. By the teaching the gospel of Jesus Christ and then by baptizing them into Christ. 
That's our obligation and our responsibility. Paul would write in 1 Corinthians 1 and verse 21, that after that in the wisdom of God, yet please God by the foolishness of preaching to save them that believe. If those people in the world today are going to be saved, it's going to be by us preaching the gospel to them. Denominational world is not going to preach the gospel to them. They're going to preach a perverted gospel, which is not a gospel at all. It will lead no one to heaven. It will lead all of them to eternal damnation. They're not going to preach the gospel. They're not going to make disciples of Christ. They're not going to save anyone with the doctrine that they're preaching. We can't expect angels to come down from heaven and do the job for us. It's our responsibility. God chose it by preaching. He would save those that believe. In 2 Corinthians 5th chapter, and verse 10, Paul reminds us of the judgment that we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, that everyone may receive the things done in his body according to that he hath done, whether it be good or evil. Verse 11 then states, Knowing therefore the terror of the Lord, we persuade men. That's our duty, to go out. Why? Because we know the judgment that's coming. We know that there is a heaven to be gained, a hell to be avoided. We know the terrors of that hell that is there. Knowing therefore the terror of the Lord, that God will come and He will exercise judgment upon them. And yes, He's going to come in flaming fire taking vengeance. Knowing that terror... What do we do? We go out preaching the gospel to them. We persuade people to obey the truth. That's the way God chose. We're not going, we can't rely upon God to give a direct somehow feeling or send the Holy Spirit into their heart to convict them and convert them. No, God doesn't do that. He uses human agency in order to accomplish his purpose of saving people today. And that human agency is our responsibility. That's us. But if you go back to this text in John 4, verse 35 and 36, Say not ye, there are yet four months, then cometh the harvest. Behold, I say unto you, lift up your eyes and look on the fields, for they are white already to harvest. And he that reapeth receiveth wages, and gathereth fruit unto eternal life, that, that both he that soweth and he that reapeth may rejoice together. I'm not a, I don't like working in the yard. I don't like planting a garden. I don't enjoy those things, but many of you do. But before you get the harvest, what do you have to do? Well, there's a whole lot of work that's involved, and you have to go and you start tilling the soil. You have to prepare it, don't you? And then you have to plant some uh, seeds. If you don't plant, you're not going to reap anything, are you? And then you have to keep all of the weeds out and everything. You have to nurture those seeds so that they grow. And you continue on. You know, I don't even know all of the process and I don't care to know it. Not just me, but uh, there's a lot of work prior to reaping the harvest. And, and finally, after all of that work, you reap the harvest and you can eat the food from it. Jesus is talking about here's fields white in the harvest. What does that mean? There's been a lot of work out here that's been done already. There are some places that are very open to the gospel of Jesus Christ. You go there, 
And there's still a few places in our old world today that you go and there's going to be great responses. People will obey the gospel just left and right. Our nation used to be likened to that. You could present the truth and people would be there to hear the truth and they would obey the truth. And you can take those exact same sermons that they preached at that time and preach them today and there will not be one response in our society. But you can go other places in other societies and there will be a great response. There are some places that are white in the harvest. The harvest is ready, it's there. And yes, we need laborers being sent into those harvests. But guess what? There's other places where the harvest is not ready. And there's going to be a lot of work that has to be done in order to prepare it to where there is time for a harvest. A lot of times we forget that. And so we go out and we start, for example, knocking doors. And we go up to that door, I'm not interested, go away. And sometimes they'll take the packet that we hand them. And every once in a while we can even get a conversation involved. But we see very little results. And we start getting discouraged. It's not worth it. You know, we're putting out all this effort. We're doing all of this work, and we're not seeing great results. Why aren't the 3,000 being baptized? Why were there only 3,000 baptized? It's recorded that possibly one to two million people were there on the day of Pentecost. And there had been preparation made for 1,500 years for that occasion. 1,500 years, yes, yeah, from the time in which Moses gave the law. And that law, what did Jesus say? Search the scriptures, for in them they, you think you have life, and they are they that testify of me. And when Jesus comes, he's there three and a half years with them, working with them, and doing good works and preaching the gospel of the kingdom. He sends his apostles out to preach that same message. He sends the 70 out with that message. And now then, through all of this preparatory work, and only 3,000 people obey the gospel on the day of Pentecost. What a sad showing. We tend to think of it the opposite way. Think about the hundreds of thousands, if not millions of people who rejected it. And yet all of that work that had been taken and done during all of those years, and now then, all of those people rejected. There has to be, yes, a toiling of the soil, getting rid of all of those weeds. There has to be a planting of that seed. There have to, has to be a nurturing of that seed. There has to be a lot of work done before someone will accept the gospel of Jesus Christ. And many times we want to jump over here to their accepting the gospel of Jesus Christ without ever laying the groundwork for it. And when we start planting the seed, when we start prepare, or preparing the soil so that we can plant the seed, we get discouraged and say, we don't have a harvest already. And we quit. And brethren, that's the wrong thing to do. We have to look, yes, there's a, a harvest out there. It might be in the future. It might be years from now before we ever see a response. And if it's a response like on the day of Pentecost, well, you know, here's the millions who rejected it and only 3,000 obeyed it. Now, how many doors have you knocked? 
How many people have you talked to? How many people have you urged to come to hear the truth of God's Word? How many people have you sat down and said, let's have a Bible study together? And yet, we expect the harvest without the work. We have to, yes, look upon those fields. There are some that are white in the harvest, but there is a lot of them. And in our society here within the United States today, there's going to have to be a lot of groundwork that needs to be done before there's a harvest. The song that Paul changed to before the lesson expresses it very well, though, from our standpoint. You never mentioned him to me, that one written by James Rowe, that when in the better land before the bar we stand, I know how deeply grieved our souls will be. He's not talking about those who are lost. He's talking about us as Christians. How deeply grieved our souls will be if any lost one there should cry in deep despair, you never mention him to me. How many people on the day of judgment can point to you and say, you didn't tell me. You didn't say anything to me. You knew the way. You knew the words of salvation. Yeah, you didn't say anything. And I'm going to spend an eternity in torment because you didn't do your job. Now, just to give another aspect of this, and I recognize that individual in the world has an obligation also. He has an obligation upon seeing the creation, for example, to know that God exists. He has an obligation to seek after God. Uh, Acts 17 and verse 27. He has the obligation in seeking after God to find God. He has that obligation to, based upon that word of God, to obey the truth. He has those obligations. But it's our obligation to go with that message of salvation to them. And yes, spread the word wherever it may be heard in verse 2 of that song. Help groping souls the light to see. That yonder none may say, You showed me not the way, you never mentioned him to me. And verse 3 then says, A few sweet words make guide a lost one to his side. Or turn sad eyes on Calvary. And uh, so work. Yes, there's that work that's involved in spreading the gospel of Jesus Christ. So work as days go by that yonder none may cry. You never mention him to me. We have our job to do. But do we do it? But in looking on the things of others, not only are we to teach the gospel unto them, Philippians 2 and verse 4 states, Look not every man on his own things, but every man also on the things of others. We need and must have a concern for others and their life, their soul. Paul puts it in Galatians 6 and verse 2 and with these words, Bear ye one another's burdens, and so fulfill the law of Christ. Now here's the law of Christ, and it's fulfilled by my bearing others' burdens. Now, we recognize a few verses later in verse 5, he says that every man must bear his own burdens. And we start looking at those in some individuals uh, want to say, oh, the Bible contradicts itself. No, it doesn't. It's recognizing in verse 5 that there are certain personal responsibilities that I have that nobody can do those for me. Nobody can help me. I've got to do those things myself. They're my personal responsibility. But there are other things within my life that others can help me with. And that's verse 2. Bearing one another's burdens. 
Now this is going to be seen in, for example, sympathy with others. In 1 Corinthians 12th chapter, now we understand that chapters 12, 13, and 14 are dealing primarily with miraculous powers, but the church at Corinth was being, were being divided over these miraculous powers. And some were becoming arrogant because they had a certain miraculous power and, some, and others didn't. And so Paul is showing the need for all of us working together. And in relationship to that, he uses the figure of a body, that a body has to work together, that uh, you can't have just an eye without the rest of the body. You can't have an ear without the rest of the body. You need the whole body working together. And he says in relationship to that in verse 26 of chapter 12, and whether one member suffer, all the members suffer with it. Or one member be honored, all the members rejoice with it. What is it? Here is someone who is in sorrow, a member of the body of Christ, a Christian. And what is it? We are there to bear their burden with them, their sorrow with them. And so we weep with those that weep and rejoice with those that rejoice. Member is honored over here. And we're there with them, not jealous or envious because they're honored and we weren't. But we're rejoicing with them. A care and concern one for another that causes us to join one with another and helping one another. Let's face it. We are all going to go through difficult times. We're all going to have trials and tribulations within our life. And we're all then going to need help at times. And so what is it? We look not every man on our own things. We don't just turn inward and say, I don't care about you. But every man also on the things of others. And so when that individual over here is going through a difficult time, we should be there with that individual to strengthen them, to help them, to aid them through that difficulty whatever that difficulty might be in whatever form it might take. We're going to be there strengthening them and aiding them and helping them. It's going to be seen in our serving of others. In Matthew, the 20th chapter, verse 26 and 27, it says, But it shall not be so among you, Jesus is saying this, but whosoever will be great among you, let him be your, sir, your minister. And whosoever will be chief among you, let him be your servant. You as Christians, he's saying here to his apostles in particular, if you want to be great, it's not going to be as the world considers greatness. It's going to be that individual who is a servant of others. And so we learn that even as Jesus came not to be ministered unto, but to minister, that it's our duty as Christians to serve others, to minister unto them. We find the need and help it. And in showing mercy on others. There's the question posed to Jesus. When, and Jesus gives a, the parable of the Good Samaritan. And finally draws it down to this man who's asking the question and says, who was the, the neighbor? And the man has to respond, he that showed mercy on him. In other words, while this priest and Levite passed by on the other side. Levi might have even gone over and looked on him and then gone on. Here's this Samaritan who takes care of his need. Who showed mercy? It's that Samaritan. Except he wouldn't even call him a Samaritan. That one that showed mercy on him. And Jesus' responds. Go and do thou likewise. Go show mercy, compassion on other individuals. That's us as Christians. 
that here our world is in pain and is hurting. There's people who have difficulties and we go and show mercy on those individuals. We show compassion toward them. Feeling and compassion means sympathy or passion with. With passion. We have passion with them. We feel with them. Empathy is what we many times refer to. But we also do good to them. We aid them. We help them during that time. That's part of that tilling the soil. Preparing the soil for the seed of the kingdom. And so we start showing compassion on others. Helping others. Serving others doing good unto them, feeling with them during those difficult times. And then we have that opportunity. Let me tell you about the gospel of Jesus Christ. That's when we have the opportunity to teach them. Because we're not looking upon our own things, we and so many times the church of our Lord today has turned inward. Let me see what I can do for myself. What's the church going to do for me? Instead of, let me get involved and do some work. And that's the attitude of the Christian. That attitude of, What's, what are you going to do for me? Is an ungodly attitude. And yet, that's the attitude that it's so many, even within the church of our Lord, express. Our duty is not to look on every man his own things, but to, yes, look upon the things of others. Look on others. To teach them the gospel of Jesus Christ. To show compassion. To serve them. To show mercy. To have sympathy with them. Aid them and help them. So we can teach them the gospel of Jesus Christ. Our job as Christians is exactly the same thing that Christ expressed. That the Son of Man has come to seek and to save that which was lost. Luke 19 and verse 10. Our job is to seek and to save that which was lost. Looking upon others and not upon self. Now if you've not obeyed that gospel of Jesus Christ, we plead with you. Obey the truth this morning. Upon your faith, repent of your sins. Make the confession of your faith that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God. And then be baptized in water for the forgiveness of your sins. But then it takes a continued faithfulness to God. Living the way that He wants us to live. And if you haven't been living that way as a child of God, why not come back and turn? Repent of your sins and let us pray with you for the forgiveness of them so that you can enjoy that blessed hope that the Christian has. You need to come this morning and do so as we stand and sing this invitation song.